Customers today are looking to leverage GPUs for many different use cases. They want to run high fidelity graphics intensive applications, render scenes faster, and stream higher resolution games, all at a low cost. They want to train and deploy complex machine learning models to deliver new customer experiences. Amazon EC2 G5 instances deliver up to three times higher performance for graphics intensive applications and up to three times higher performance for ML inference when compared to Amazon EC2 G4DN instances. G5 instances feature up to eight NVIDIA A10G Tensor Core GPUs and second generation AMD EPIC processors and support up to 100 gigabits per second of networking throughput and 7.6 terabytes of local NVMe storage. With support for NVIDIA RTX technology and more ray tracing cores than other NVIDIA GPU instances, they're ideal for running powerful graphics workstations and rendering larger videos faster. With updated tensor cores based on the NVIDIA Ampere architecture, G5 instances can be used for high performance and cost-efficient ML training and inference. Access the power you need and get started with Amazon EC2 G5 instances. But I cannot allow it to stop me. I'm a network development engineer at Amazon Web Services. I moved to Dublin six years ago. It wasn't easy to leave my family and friends behind. I had to start anew in a country where I didn't know anybody. Here at AWS, we build a network of support and an inclusive culture. My team innovates ways to automate and scale our network. Together with our engineers, we design new standards for how AWS data centers are built. We are committed to provide a stable network our clients deserve. I'm grateful for the supportive colleagues who made setting in easier for everyone who pushes me to be the best that I can be. My name is Luisa Popa, and I am a builder. Welcome to the 15th episode of the Community Night series, building your first serverless application. My name is Tamsel Acosta, so I'm a solutions architect at AWS. And today I will be sharing with you about serverless and what are the different components that you can use in order to um, successfully build your first serverless application. Let us first define what a serverless is. So when we say serverless, one of the most common misconceptions um, is that there are no servers running underneath that um, serverless application or platform. But in reality, the reason why we call it serverless is because we're building and running applications without um, the need to think about the servers. So for this, we're going to use AWS Lambda. So Lambda is a compute service that lets you run code without provisioning any servers. So you just upload your code and then Lambda will take care of everything required in order to run or scale your code with high availability. So if you want to um, hone your technical skills in building serverless applications, so feel free to visit our hands-on projects or hands-on workshops in our AWS um, website. This series is co-presented by Amazon Web Services AWS and AWS Cloud Computing. Gremlin provides failure as a service. We proactively break things to find the weak spots and systems to help make them stronger. The analogy I often draw is that of the flu shot or the vaccine. We're gonna inject a little bit of harm in order to find those weak spots and build an immunity. So I, I cut my teeth in this space about 10 years ago working for Amazon.com. We were part of the retail website availability team and it was our job to make sure that the website didn't go down. When the website goes down, it costs a lot of money in terms of revenue. 
And most of what we did was reactive. After things are broken, how quickly can we fix it? What we found was this was a, a proactive thing we could do to prepare, to prevent outages from ever occurring. This isn't really a new idea. We were doing hardware failure testing in the 60s and 70s. People were writing papers and talking about this in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s. But what we've seen as people move to the cloud, as people adopt these microservice architectures, these distributed systems, now we're ever more reliant on other people's software. And so one, one aspect is prepare for the things that can go wrong to us. A host could disappear, a network device could fail, a, you know, a disk could fill up. The other part is preparing for what happens when our dependencies fail. So if I store things in S3 or Dynamo and they happen to experience a hiccup, I want to be prepared so that I can ensure that my customers don't feel that pain and we gracefully degrade where possible. So when things break, that tends to be a, a common impetus to get better. But we'd like it to be a bit more proactive, something you prepare for. A lot of people are adopting this DevOps SRE movement. You know, you build it, you own it, you operate it. And so now it becomes ever more important that engineers can practice this, that they can go out and do this in advance. And so a lot of our customers, they're doing monitoring, they're doing alerting, they're, they're seeing how their systems behave. This is a way to verify that you've set it up correctly. As silly as it sounds, I've been part of many outages where somebody wasn't monitoring something correctly, somebody didn't get paged, and something took three or four times longer than it needed to to fix. So I see we have a lot of customers moving to the cloud or moving to Kubernetes or doing different environments. And they often say, oh, you know what, we'll worry about this chaos engineering or resilience after we're there. I think that's a little, a little silly. You want to you wanna mitigate the risk of this large investment you're doing. You want to ensure that when you're there, your systems run at least as well as they did before, if not better. And so you want to invest in this as part of that move. It helps you de-risk it. It helps you prepare for it and ensure that your systems behave well and that your customers don't feel that pain. There's nothing more powerful in life than trying something new. Learn what a first step towards AWS training and certification means. The first time I created a system that I'd never existed before, it felt like catching my first wave surfing. Both require persistence and skill, but the thrill is like nothing else. With my AWS certification to support me, I can help the wider team see the bigger picture and design a solution that pushes the boundaries of what's possible. Back then, I was riding a wave of fun. Now, I'm riding a wave of innovation. The first time my event-driven architecture was mentioned by Vanna Vogels, the CTO of Amazon, I felt on top of the world. It took me back to being 10 and launching my first homemade rockets. Back then, I only dreamed of being an inventor. Today, I'm living my dream because my knowledge and skills give me the confidence to invent anything. If I can learn tax law, I can learn anything. That thought was the first time I felt all things are possible if you have the right knowledge and skills. Most of my family worked in IT and I knew cloud was the future. So I jumped from accountancy to a career in cloud design that really feels like me. Back then, my family gave me the confidence to retrain. Now, I'm the one filling my clients with confidence. What will your AWS first be? Good morning everyone, welcome to the 16th episode of the Community Ignite series, AWS Certification Tips and Tricks. So, my name is Alvin Delagon and, um, and I'm a solutions architect working for Amazon Web Services. Uh, tips and tricks, strategies and suggestions that I'm going to state here doesn't guarantee you passing the certification exam. Alright? So, my, the content here was developed from my own personal experience and not by Amazon Web Services. So, this, okay. so and just also a little bit of background. So this, this, these techniques that I developed over the years um, allowed me to pass, uh, take past seven certifications already. Okay, so 
sa ano sa indoor playing games so what I'm saying is that first you, tr- you try to understand what what is your enemy is so you identify the class so in real life diba? so what we do is that we identify the pillar that's actually where we try to identify the objective and the context pagdating naman sa AWS certification this is actually where you eliminate and choose answers either submit or mark for review yeah, thank you so much to our co-presenters AWS and AWS Cloud Philippines Hello, hello everyone and good evening. Kumusta naman kayo? Welcome to another episode of our Community Ignite series. Good evening and good Thursday night. Ayan, I am your host, Rose of Yanga, your Senior Technical Community Manager here at Education PH and AWS Club Pilipinas. Okay, Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, type L, M. L for Luzon, M for Mindanao. And B for Visayas, let us know where you're coming from and where you are right now. It's maulan na gabi dito sa Mindanao. I'm based in Davao City, so hope all of you are safe at your home. We are excited for another topic now in our Community Ignite series. Ayan, V, V, L, L. Dami ito yung Tagalog son. Mami Tagatagalog, mga Tagalog. Yes, hello, thank you. And... By the way, we are also live on Facebook, so feel free to share our Facebook live on your on your timeline. Para naman makajoin yung mga friends nyo. All right. So before we start, what is Community Ignite series? For those who are first timers, uh, Community Ignite series are our Thursdays episodes of learning new skills from our global speakers with Amazon. So bit by bit. We, you would certainly accumulate these skills that would eventually uplift you on your tech career journey. So this event is co-presented by Amazon Web Services and AWS Club Filipinas. There you go. Yes. So last week, everyone, we learned about the tips and tricks on how to become a certified AWS developer. No? So to those who joined, uh, tell us something what you learned about how to be AWS certified. Meron bang nag-join dito last week? Ayan, make sure. Yes, make sure to follow us every time so that you can accumulate not just e-certificates, but of course, learning new skills, no? So we do take note of your topics, requests, and with your Answers on our CSAT survey, uh, we list down all the topics that you want to learn. So make sure to follow our Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn to stay updated. Search nyo lang, AWS Club Filipinas, or scan the QR code flash on our screen. There you go. If you share this event, make sure to use the hashtag AWS Club PH. Education PH or Community Ignite series. So tonight, everyone, you will learn a new topic. It's also quite new to me, no? But don't you worry, because our speaker will handle that for us to make sure that we understand. So without further ado, let me introduce to you our speaker. Imported to, ha? Huh? <laughs> yes. Yes, imported. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So he has been in the information communication technology and operational technology domains for more than 25 years. Wow. In various leadership roles with various enterprises and systems engineering, data center and network operations, information security and solutions architecture. He is also engaged with CXOs, operations, corporate strategy and IT of customers and partners with portfolios of end-to-end digital enterprise solutions, covering mid to large scale business applications, operations, and infrastructure across various areas. So everyone, please meet the AWS Certified Solutions Architect Professional, Paul Sears. Hello, everybody. Hello. Good evening. Hi, Paul. Good evening. How are you? Where are you uh, based? 
dollars. I'm based in Manila. I live in BGC actually. So oh, that's cool. So I should put an L on the chat for Luzon, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't seen any M here. Where are the people from Mindanao? <laughs> right, right. Yes, there you go. Great. Well, I'm excited about uh, the presentation this evening. I won't keep my video on because I am doing this from home and my sometimes my internet connection does get a little slow, but I want to at least let you see my face, put a fa name to the face. Uh, I've been with um, AWS Philippines for since 2019. Uh, and I, before that, I was working with AWS in the US. Uh, I started in 2016. So I've been with AWS for uh, close to or five, almost six years or close to six years. Uh, so um, I love being here. This is great. Um, I know a little Tagalog, not that much, but so my talk will be in English. I do apologize, but I do support a lot of customers, uh, enterprise, SMB, all across Philippines and uh, actually other countries as well. I, before the pandemic, I used to travel a lot to uh, to Singapore and Malaysia and Indonesia and Thailand and Vietnam. Just also uh, help customers there as well. We have a lot of customers that are uh, in the Philippines that also have. Uh, you know, either cooperation or manufacturing facilities in other countries. So we do a lot of work across geographies within the ASEAN region, the ASEAN region. So anyway, uh, I'm going to share my screen now, if that's okay. Go and on. Take it away. Sure. And uh, hopefully this goes well. I hope everybody can see my screen uh, and I will turn off my video now. So um, I actually really enjoyed the uh, the intro by uh, video from Gremlin. I didn't know about them, but uh, in essence, uh, that video kind of summarized what we're going to talk about today. And today is really um, what I call operational observ observability or using the power of chaos and otherwise known as chaos engineering. So um, uh, my background, I already covered a little bit, but I've been I've done this talk before and I, I really enjoy this topic. And I think we're going to continue to expand uh, this topic uh, in terms of how customers can leverage uh, chaos to uh, to better improve the resiliency and availability of their services. Uh, one thing I also do in AWS is I'm an I'm an SME subject matter expert on what we call well architected, which is um, a framework of best practices across five different pillars, operation, security, uh, reliability, uh, performance, and cost. And so part of this, part of the best practices is also covered about how you do things like uh, use chaos to your advantage. So let's go ahead and get started here. Um, and hopefully everything goes well. Oh, there's my little chaos gorilla or uh, Godzilla there showing up finally. <laughs> okay, so um, how to profit from chaos. So we're gonna cover a little agenda here. What is chaos engineering? We're gonna find some ob objectives. We're gonna release the Kraken and then we're going to make profit. Okay, that's really the summary of what we're gonna do here. And actually chaos engineering can be kind of fun, uh, at least part of it. And then it can be challenging to rid your environments of chaos potentials. So um, imagine you are running your you are uh, running your websites in, or some big corporate uh, portal or maybe you have a big SAP uh, system in the back end and all of a sudden you're getting errors. Um, this is uh, a a very uh, uncomfortable situation for companies because this is often, you know, like, for example, if you're going to buy something, you're going to shop online or you're going to visit for a site for information and you go there and there's errors, you, you become frustrated. You have a poor customer experience and the organizations, the companies that are having the issue are not able to reach their clients, their own customers, and they can lose money and, and uh, it can be very expensive for them. Uh, I, before I joined AWS, I used to run, uh, uh, or actually many years ago before AWS, I used to run very, very large data centers. Um, and uh, we're talking on the orders of tens of thousands of servers. I had a data center uh, complex in Los Angeles and one in uh, Slough, England, uh, which is outside of London. And when you have 10,000 plus servers in each environment, things will always go wrong. Uh, we always had hardware failures. We had other issues, configuration issues, pushing out every time we make changes, always be a problem. So so this is something that's always around there. And when uh, we were running data centers at that, that scale, losing or having an outage for any period of time 
where we're losing millions of dollars. So this is can be very, very expensive uh, to have errors or when customers cannot reach your content or cannot purchase uh, from your systems or and such. So it's very, very important to uh, to understand how the how it impacts you. So chaos theory is actually a theory uh, and uh, basically is that uh, it postulates that firstly complex systems for example like weather have an underlying order second the reverse of that that simple systems can produce complex behavior so th this is kind of a, as a whole science around chaos theory and how uh how order can be derived from chaos and how uh, order can can yeah, de-evolve into chaos so it's actually something very interesting it's a great topic to get into much deeper we're going to cover more on the uh on the technology side of things okay uh, so we'll go in and get in here. And so, um, you know, you can uh, imagine that uh, your everything in infrastructure is just a series of data, right? Data flowing in and out, in and out. And uh, if you ever watched the movie Matrix, some of you may not have seen this, but I, I'm old enough to have watched the movie many, many times. Um, this was, there was actually scenes in the movie where the operators in the, uh, were able to read this particular like data and 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 visualize what's happening, right? So, but you'll see here it looks very chaotic. There's actually order to this data that you may not see so um and then eventually become when you become uh, aware you can you can you can clear the chaos and get the order and you can see actually what's actually happening in there okay so uh chaos engineering is a discipline of experimenting on a software system in production in order to build confidence that the system's capability to withstand turbulent and unexpected conditions. I want to emphasize that this is in production. You do not do your chaos engineering on dev environments or your QA environments. Of course, when you're developing software, releasing systems, you're always going to test. You're going to do integration testing and unit testing in your QA or, or UAT environments. But that's not the intention of chaos engineering. Chaos engineering wants to see how production behaves and how it can handle unexpected conditions. And you cannot replicate that uh, between dev and UAT into production. It does not the same environment. It doesn't, enough, there's too many variables in place. So you want to make sure you actually do this in production. Now, before everybody goes out there and starts uh, uh, disrupting your production environments, you need to make sure you're on board with your leadership that they are, they understand what chaos engineering is and the intent behind it. But the whole idea is to discover where your systems have weak points, where they, how they can handle, how can they withstand unexpected things, okay? And my slide didn't go, oops, there we go. So our CTO, you may have saw him on a video earlier, Werner Vogels has made this famous, very, very famous uh, uh, quote, everything fails all the time. And this is absolutely true. I knew, I knew this before I joined AWS. I mean, as I said, I ran large data centers. And we had failures all the time. Something was always uh, failing to work properly or, or misconfigured or something. It's just on that scale, things are going to break. It's just inevitable. Um, hard disks will fail. Servers will, power supplies will fail. Everything like that will go will, will happen. So um, you know things uh, just just will go wrong. So what you do is you build and you design for failure, and that's actually how. Uh, software engineering and how architecture has evolved in that we sense we want to to plan for things that can go wrong and engineer a way a way around those things so that we have survivability and availability of our services. Okay, uh, so um, what we want to do with case engineering, we want to break system components in a controlled manner to see how in the entire system reacts right and so what comes down to is just what we want we want to identify single points of failures they're called spas and you want to eliminate you want to identify where they are in your system your architecture your infrastructure whatever you're looking at you want to identify the single points of failure and you want to uh, remove them which results in increase of uh, increasing your resiliency of that system, 
Okay, so let's let's look at a very typical um, infrastructure. You may have a database server, a high, very very important database server. Maybe it's your SAP system or some critical mission critical database server. You typically have a second database server on standby because you're going to expect that that primary one to fail at some time. Maybe a hard disk will fail, maybe the CPU will fail or power supply, and then you fail over. You have a second one. So if you eliminated a single point of failure. Basically, I mean, and, and it, technically there's still failure scenarios, but you eliminated that particular uh, point of failure. So you will go through your entire architecture. You'll go through your entire application architecture and identify those single points of failure uh, and you will eliminate those. That's the, really the intent and purpose of chaos engineering is identify these single points of failure and to remove them from your system. So here's some best, uh, your basic principles of chaos in practice. So you thought of a facilitation of experiments to uncover systemic weaknesses. And you do this, you actually have a mythology. You don't, you don't actually apply chaos to your process. You have an order to your process, but you use chaos engineering to disrupt what's happening, to understand how that system behaves when it's been disrupted. So the first thing to do that, you need to have a steady state. You got to have a baseline. You got to know how the system behaves that you consider it to be normal. Okay, normal behavior. So, so if your if your website is serving your customers and there's no errors, then you can maybe you consider that normal behavior. And then what you want to do is you want to hy uh, hypothesize that this steady state will continue in both the control group and the experimental group, meaning you're going to have two groups and you're going to make sure one doesn't get changed and one you muck with, you mess with, you disrupt. Then three, you introduce variables that reflect real, real world events like servers that crash, hard drives that malfunction, network connections that are severed, and you, you, you see how that works in the experimental group. And then you try to disprove your hypothesis by looking for the difference in the steady state between the control group and the experimental group. And if you have built a resilient system, your control group and experimental group will be identical. You won't have any disruptions. So that's the principle of chaos. There's actually a website you can go to called principlesofchaos.org. You want to learn more about this. Okay. So here's some advanced pr uh, principles. Build a hypothesis around steady state behavior. Vary your real world events. Then you run your experiments in production. You don't do this in a dev isolated environment. You're actually running in production and I'll get more into that into a, in a minute. And you want to automate this to run continuously. You just don't run and break your in production environment one time and say, okay, we're done. We know what's wrong, we'll fix it later and we're done. No, this is something you do all the time. You want to, because your systems will evolve, they'll change. You'll have new software releases. You'll introduce new infrastructure, maybe a new server or, 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 or even you'll change your data structures in your database or where you store your data. All these things are gonna be, all these constant changes mean you need to continuously experiment and see what fails. And the final point, which is actually probably most important of all, is you want to minimize your blast radius. Now, when we say you run your experiments in production, we don't mean you actually run it against your entire production environment and bring your company down for five hours and lose millions of dollars or, or millions of pesos. You don't do that. But you minimize the blast radius. So maybe you pick some pieces of your infrastructure that you can mess with and try out and, and under a controlled environment, a controlled process, introduce chaos into those those areas, the blast radius. We want to minimize the overall damage. We don't want to disrupt your organization or your operations where you lose money, but at the same time, we want to discover what disruptions and how they impact your system so you don't experience the outages that cost you your, your, your business uh, you know, revenue, right? You don't want to do that, right? So, so it's kind of a, it's, it's, it's a balance. Um, so you just don't go on, just don't go and do everything and then say, okay, great, have fun. But no, it's, it's a little more thought to it. So there's order to how you introduce chaos. Okay, and try next slide. And here we go. So what we're going to do is we do what's called fault injection, which is a technique for improving the coverage of a test by introducing faults to test code paths, in particular error handling code paths that 
otherwise might rarely be followed. So uh, this is really applicable for app, uh, software engineering, application design, because you want to make sure you handle all these error codes and error paths. Make sure you handle them properly. You want to give your users, the, the user of the application, a good experience and don't get them stuck somewhere with an error, no error type scenario. Uh, but it also applies for infrastructure, OK? Um, so with the end game we're going to try to get here is resiliency. We want to improve the ability of a system to survive unexpected component failures through elimination of spoffs and managing risks, ultimately increasing customer experience. So when we increase your customer experience, you will increase your revenues or your brand image. Um, and uh, it, it, we're going to get into some ways we, we will do this and show you some, some approaches you can take. But this is actually very important. And um, you, the, the, uh, a lot of, lot of uh, organizations, when they start out, they put a lot of energy into releasing their products quickly to get to the market faster in order to build themselves. But once they get established, they start building a brand. And customer experience is very important to maintaining a brand and increasing your revenue. So you want, you don't want to have bad experiences. I, I, I can't, I mean, not going to pick on any any particular uh, provider here in the Philippines, but there's been a number of times. I actually, I'll give you a really good example of a failure scenario that left me with a very poor customer experience for a, a telco provider where I overpaid my bill by a little bit. And when I did that, I, the system thought I didn't pay my bill and it and it disrupted my internet. It, it took my internet off because it said I hadn't paid my bill. Even though I had paid my bill, I had a negative balance. And they didn't have the ability to understand how um, to automatically their system would go in and check your balance and see what you owed and it would disable, dis disconnect you if you had a balance. It didn't understand that a negative balance was not a balance. And so it acted incorrectly and it gave me a bad experience. And I, and it, it's not something that, you know, I'll remember this for a long time. So customer experience is very important. You want to make sure you eliminate your, your system components, you eliminate your, sorry, eliminate your single points of failure, manage your risk, and make your systems resilient to give your customers the best experience. And it could be either software uh, design uh, resiliency or application operations or infrastructure resiliency into all aspects of it, okay? It's end to end. Okay, so uh, I covered these already, sorry. My slides aren't building properly uh, for some reason. Uh, so I keep clicking my mouse button and they don't go do anything. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next slide here. Um, hopefully I get there. I don't know why it's keep doing that. I think it's, I th okay. So what do we do? How do we really do this, right? Um, what, what do we do for, for uh, what, what tools and approaches can we take to do this? So what you can do is simply do is release the Kraken, right? If you may have heard his expression, this is like the, the Kraken is a giant, super giant octopus monster that goes out and, and attacks ships and sinks the ships. We actually don't do that. We don't just unleash chaos in the environment. We will do it through order. We will do an orderly approach to how we introduce chaos to test the resiliency of our systems, okay? So as you can see here, one does not simply release the Kraken. What we do is, what do we do? What do we do, right? What is our what is our things we need to do? Okay, so one thing you wanna do is you wanna establish uh, a team or a role or somebody in the organization that is considered to be what's considered a site reliability engineer, site reliable, reliability engineer, excuse me. Site reliability engineering is a discipline that incorporates the aspect of software engineering, but also applies into infrastructure and operations problems. And obviously you can read this definition here, but the goals are to create scalable and highly reliable software systems. And the software systems is not just the application, but also, also the infrastructure that's running it as well, okay? So, so um, you wanna establish someone uh, who, 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 or someone or some team that owns this. It could be an operations, it could be IT, it could be a whole separate team if you want to. It could be in your UAT or QA team, but the, 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 the engineers need to understand a system 
end-to-end -end software as well as infrastructure. Um, Google used to, uh, Google actually, I think, was one of the earlier pioneers of site reliability engineering. Uh, they actually um, have a big SRE uh, uh, team that across the globe that goes and tries and understands how things break and how to make your systems more resilient so that they don't have the disruptions. Because whenever there's a large outage uh, for a provider such as Google or anybody else or even AWS for that matter, there is a huge amount of negative publicity, uh, customers are impacted and everything else. So, so we don't really have the luxury of, have, uh, of, of uh, leaving things to randomly break. We need to make sure everything we design and we do deliver is scalable. Uh, sorry, res uh, scale, survivable, resilient, and as well scalable. Okay, you can bring uh, you can bring, uh, you can use chaos to create order. Okay, so first establish SRE team, and then select your chaos processes and tools. So you need to have some sort of tooling to do this. Remember, we want to automate things and have this running in a continuous manner across your uh, your application stack. Okay, now obviously when you first do this, you want to test these tools out in a controlled environment, maybe in your dev or, or UAT environment, see how these tools actually behave to make sure you understand that they don't have unintended issues unintended uh, uh, consequences of running these tools. Um, you don't want a tool that goes and, and deletes your data, but you do, you do want a tool that goes and disrupts your system. So make sure you understand the tools you use. Um, you want to identify your workload. So initially start small. Pick a small workload that isn't necessarily mission critical. Um, maybe even not so super visible to everybody, but at least get the buy-in from your leadership with the, and have the SRA team try the processes out, right? Test out how they want to do this, how they want to automate the process, what tools they're going to use, and try it on a, on, a, on a small workload. And then as you do over time, you get experience and get better. You grow and hit lar pick larger and larger workloads, Okay. Part of this process, and this is the heavy lifting here, is you need to thoroughly map and document all the system components. You need to know what the impact is, the blast radius. And this includes the application. So you need to know the application itself, all the dependencies the application has, all the app, all, all the infrastructure application, uh, sorry, infrastructure dependencies they have and how they interact together. Okay, if you go pick a small workload and it is like, for example, an authentication system, and you take it down and everything shuts down because of that, that dependency, that's not a good, not not a good workload to test out with. So you want to make sure you understand everything end to end. And I know for a lot of organizations. Thorough documentation is is challenging at best. Okay, uh, so you may have to do some of this yourself. You may have to go and talk to the various DevOps teams and and uh, whoever owns whoever is the, the the you know the guru of that particular application or infrastructure and talk to them and document what they know so you can understand the blast radius. This is very very important. Okay. Now you want to understand unexpected behavior components. You want to understand how things are supposed to work. So things are working properly. What do they do? What does the database do? How's the database? How do you know it's working properly? What is this web server doing? Is it working properly based on what? What is your what is your uh, criteria for understanding what is expected? Okay. And then you want to document your dependencies and create run books because when you break things, you need to know how to recover from those things that are broken. Understand the dependency. So this is again, very, very critical. You don't want to work on a system or take a system down that has a larger impact than you expected. Part of understanding uh, uh, or part, part of being an SR on an SR team is to understand the scopes very, very clearly and all dependencies involved, okay? Now you want to carefully break things. You want, you want to, and carefully is a is a loosely defined term depending on your organization, and I'll kind of get in that that into a minute. And then you want to assess the results. When you break things, how did the system behave? Did it react what you way you expected it to react? Did it did it react at all? Was it disrupted? Document what happens. Okay. And then when you do that, remediate those risks. So let's say you, you work on a workload, it's a, it's a simple website and you break something and the website goes down, see what happened. Can you eliminate a single point of failure? Were there single points of failure? Was it something else you didn't understand? This is part of get documentation and this is a, this is a continuous cycle. You will continuously uh, build your knowledge, understanding of this particular system and you will break it and understand it, break it again, understand it, remediate the problems and break it again. This is a process over and over and over again. And you rinse and then you repeat.
right? This is in a nutshell what you do. But again, you got to have a team that understands these systems. And uh, it's going to gonna be someone who's going to be cross discipline. Okay, it won't be a, a, a QA engineer necessarily, but maybe a QA, QA engineer who understands uh, the engineering side, the DevOps side, and also maybe uh, who understands the operations side. You got to have someone, or at least your team needs to be considered, needs to be comprised of members that understand the different disciplines involved. Okay, because you have many systems in place here you have many different uh, disciplines uh, in an organization that are that are working together to deliver something so let's talk about ca carefully introducing uh, or breaking things so you you all I'm sure everybody knows Netflix and Netflix is very very famous for this so Netflix um, to them uh, if you have a situation where you cannot watch their video it relates it causes a bad experience and they can they may they risk losing you as a subscriber and that's very 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 bad for them so they want to make sure their their environment is as resilient as possible as as possible they can design it okay and um they started with this uh tool they built they created called chaos monkey uh and it was released uh my, my gosh uh 2011 or 12 or, or some time ago um it's now on github you can go here and get this stuff called simian army but the purpose of chaos monkey was they would they would they would run this 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 application in their environment and chaos monkey would go randomly turn off instances in aws so just turn them off just say oh this one's off boom then they had to see what happens it would cause situations it would cause uh impact it would cause disruptions and they want to understand if this particular instance went down why did it have a disruption why did it impact everything else and this was what they did for for running and building their systems to be super resilient across the entire infrastructure of, of aws that they use as well as their own infrastructure they use to deliver the content so they they um they take these principles very very much to heart and they then wanted to go bigger so first they're working on instance failures okay let's turn off an instance uh, a database server and i see what happens well not manually but having chaos monkey do it randomly whenever so you always you don't know what's going to happen it's not like you're you're all prepared you want to re react to it but they wanted to go bigger than that so obviously if, if you are using aws you are aware that we have what's called availability zones so we have a region which is our geographic point in different parts of the world and inside a region we have multiple availability zones and each availability zone is a separate discrete independent stack of infrastructure data centers okay so if you're using singapore as a region there are three availability zones in singapore meaning that they are independent of each other. And if you deploy your infrastructure and your application design uh, to take advantage of multiple availability zones, if one fails, it should not disrupt you. Okay, and that's part of what we call well architected. But Chaos Gorilla, uh, Netflix built Chaos Gorilla to simulate what happens if an entire AZ fails. Now, what happens? Did they deploy their systems properly? Did they architect their systems properly across multiple availability zones to ensure resiliency, right? And then because uh, Netflix uses multiple regions to deliver their content, they have they use multiple regions on AWS. They also built Chaos Kong to simulate an entire region failure. So let's say they're operating out of three regions and they took a region offline. What happens to everybody who's using that region uh, to get their services delivery of their of their uh of their, their catalog their billing their all these things here so they they um release they, they release these things open source it's available on github it's not maintained anymore but you can still look at it as an idea or even incorporate some of these into your things but make sure whatever you tools you do decide to use you vet them very carefully understand how the tools work and under, understand their potential blast radius okay if you're running an aws and you have a large infrastructure across many az's and you run chaos gorilla understand the blast radius can be pretty large for that okay so uh that's one set of tools available so chaos uh, monkey was randomly killed instances within the architecture. This is what Netflix was saying. This is actually 2010. I'm sorry, it's so older than I actually remember. Um, they aren't if they aren't continue, constantly testing their abilities to succeed despite failure, then it won't likely work when it matters the most, right? Because you you can plan for things all you want to, but it's when the unexpected outage happens that has the biggest impact. So they that's why they actually came up with chaos monkey initially. 
So there's also some other tools. Uh, there's some. There's another tool called Litmus, which is if you're using uh, Kubernetes and containers, um, you can run a uh, this 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 tool called Litmus to create chaos uh, on Kubernetes. Okay, so it allows for developers to run chaos experiments during application development as extension of a unit testing or integration testing. So you should be pushing chaos all the way to the very, very start of your application architecture and development cycle, right? So you should be having sprints in your agile methodology that will address things like, uh, you know, you do things like functions, functional or unit testing, well, include and, and incorporate chaos into those, uh, those tests. So you understand if things don't, if, you know, we, we care so much about integration testing that things work properly when they work together. But we want to understand what happens when they don't work together. So don't toss that data, use that data to learn from it, and to improve your architecture and design. Um, we have, a, there's a CI pipeline for builders so let you run as a pipeline stage to find bugs uh, when the application is subject to fail pass in a pipeline and then for sres site reliable engineers it allows you to plan and schedule chaos experiments into the application and surrounding infrastructure and this practice will identify the weaknesses in system and increase your resiliency okay so AWS is also looking into a service that we've announced, but it's not available yet, um, but it's called Amazon Fault Injector. Uh, so it will hopefully be released uh, in the near future, uh, but it is, um, uh, it is a, a tool that helps you set up um, these experiments. And right now, you know, the initial part or scope would be EC2 and RDS and, and stuff. And yeah, and the whole part of this too is, is, is that you have these tools to create disruption, but you also need tools to monitor what's happening when things are disrupted. So you need to have monitoring as part of this whole process here. And like, for example, AWS, you can leverage CloudWatch or an event bridge to do things and understand what's happening in your environment to see how fault fault actions are caught, what what doing to your infrastructure, to your applications. And then once you do all that, you profit because you are building a bulletproof website that uh, can survive anything. You can survive disruption of a, of, a, of a database server or a web server or a, a, a DDoS attack and a flood and all these things. Or you want to be able to do all these things to understand how your systems can be resilient and allow you as an organiza your organization to keep their presence on the internet and keep the revenues up and the customer experience very, very high. Um, there's also another uh, thing we have here is called AWS Perspective, which is a solution and lets you build an architect architect diagram for a single resource. You actually can go out there and let's map out your applications in AWS uh, that will let you. Um, uh, so let's say you have you, you you've inherited or you guys have built organically your AWS stack. Now, best practice would be you don't ever deploy things manually in AWS. You will build CloudFormation templates and you will use that CloudFormation uh, descriptive uh, language to des to describe the resources uh, and infrastructure. You know that describes your infrastructure, right? So you will see you'll you'll build these EC2 servers, you'll build a database server. It's all described in CloudFormation. And that allows you to to use that that template that that cloud formation template as uh as infrastructure as code you can check it into your repos you can monitor changes to it and then when you deploy this stack you deploy it the same way every time if you want to deploy in the second region you deploy the stack again it's exactly the same way but a lot of customers grow organically they deploy a each two instance here and a database server there and they don't really document really well what's happening so you can actually use something called perspective which is a solution you'll deploy and it will attempt to diagram your infrastructure based on resources in AWS that you may not have uh, been paid attention to or lost sight of over time. It's very easy uh, to have end up having chaos all over your infrastructure because you forget about things that were done. Manual changes in large scale systems are something you always want to avoid. You want to do everything you can uh, programmatically and automatically uh, using automation tools such as CloudFormation and, uh, you know, build pipelines to deploy things 
don't make any changes to your infrastructure. In fact, we always uh, always um, say that you want your your servers to be treated like cattle, not you know. So you, they're 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 all the same. They're they're nameless. The minute you make a change to a server, you've now made that server your pet because now it's different to everything else, and you want to avoid that. And it's, you know, you have one or two servers, okay, you can deal with that. But imagine you scale and you have you have a thousand servers. How you can replicate changes across a thousand servers manually? It's just impossible to do correctly every time. And then you're introducing risk already there when you don't need to do that. So automation is a key, a part of this process. Automate your chaos, but also automate your how you do everything in AWS. So you know, understand how the system was built and how and how what the dependencies are and, and how to manage the blast radius. Okay, so I mentioned at the start of this talk, I'm an SME for well architected, which is a framework of best practices for designing and operating workloads in the cloud. Or actually, some of these some of these uh, best practices can be applied on premises as well, because it's uh, well architected is not really a technology set of uh, of uh, it's not a set of technology solutions. It's really uh, understanding how you view and uh, and implement and uh, uh, how you design in uh, across five pillars, operation, security, resilience, performance, and cost. And you actually can do a self-assessment for your application stack, your infrastructure stack on AWS console using the well-architected tool. It's no cost and it, it's a questionnaire. It's gonna have roughly 60 questions or so across the five domains. And it can ask you things like, how do you manage change in your environment? It's not, not a technology question, it's, oper it's, it's organizational or process question that's very important to how you ensure resiliency okay and also how you reserve uh, ensure security and performance all those things as well they're all related together so this is uh something i suggest if you're really going to get into to to chaos engineering understand what it means to be well architected so make sure you know you go online go to our portal we have a we have a whole site here you can download the white papers on this to understand the five pillars and you can get a, you can get exam you can actually see all the principles uh, that we talk about of of those five pillars and you can actually see the questions derived from those right so so it's very very it's a great way to to look at this in fact I work with a lot of customers and I do well, well architected training for them to help get their engineers and operations teams understand understanding how to incorporate best practices into their operations of cloud workloads. Um, you have a lot of, lot of lot more opportunity to, to do new things and innovate with cloud than you do normally on premises due to constraints that you, we don't have in the cloud. For example, if you want to test a, a new system or deploy something, you spin up a bunch of servers and a database and you're done. You, you test it and you, you don't like the way it works or you like the way it works, you can turn it off and you're done. If on premises, you need to procure hardware, you need to get approval, all these things here that that just slow everything down. You can innovate and you can innovate very quickly in AWS and you can fail fast, uh, which allows you to experiment. And that's part of the benefits of using the cloud. Well, at the same time, uh, you want to also incorporate things like well architected and chaos engineering into your architectures and infrastructure designs, okay? Okay, so that's really in a nutshell. Uh, you cannot hear me. Is my mic not working? Whoops. I just lost my, Working. hello, okay, Working. I just lost my screen here, oh, oops, sorry, back up again, okay, uh, so questions and, oops, uh, any q and I guess, right now? Yes, everyone, uh, feel free to drop your questions on our chat box, any questions, thank you, Paul, for that presentation, yes, it's while waiting for everyone to have their questions. Yeah. Sure, I'll go ahead and turn my video back on now, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we got plenty of time for questions. Uh, we can talk about anything you want to talk about, including what architected or, you know, what you do for chaos engineering, the tools and stuff. So I have to admit that when we were, I was waiting for the, the session to come online, they previewed the, the, the video from Gremlin. And I think that's a great, that's a great company. I actually never, I'm not familiar with them at all. But uh, they do what I'm talking about in this whole presentation here. They actually will run services to do exactly that, introduce gremlins into the system, right? Gremlins will, will go in and break things and see what happens, right? So, so the key here is, is, is hopefully a takeaway you understand is that 
you, you, you can design all you like into perfection, but if you, if you, you may not consider every single variable, every single scenario, right? Uh, and we don't have time to. We really don't have time to consider everything when we're designing something up front. So uh, chaos engineering allows you to, uh, to, to discover what maybe you missed and to improve on that. One question from Timothy. Yes, actually, uh, have I encountered customers that are hard to convince to do chaos engineering as they are sensitive with outages? Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, and actually chaos engineering, even though it's been around for a while, it's not a common practice in, in particularly in IT. IT operations, your whole focus is to keep everything running, right? You don't want to break anything. You don't want, you don't want, you don't want to fix what you don't have to fix. You want to just keep it running and, and stuff. So, so, um, uh, so it, it's, it, it's, it, it's customers that are in that mindset. They come from a traditional on-premise environment where introducing change can be dangerous. They're, typ they're typically resistant to uh, trying things, experimenting and seeing, especially in production, right? So yes, there are customers who do that, but customers more and more are understanding the value of discovering uh, how to discover the behavior when there's a disruption, because disruptions will happen. Uh, I, I, I guarantee disruption, whoops, my video didn't come on, here we go. Uh, here we go again. Disruptions will always happen. Uh, is, no matter what you do, you can never prevent that. Okay, so yes, to re recap, yes, there are customers who are resistant to that. How to get them to be um, open to trying these things? Well, as we mentioned in, in, the, in the steps, start small. Pick a workload. Say, hey, I, I wanna, we want to build this process. We want to try chaos engineering, introduce it to our system, see how they behave. Pick a, a workload that it really isn't that majorly impactful right? And try it and demonstrate that. And then say, look, we have a simple web system here, website and database. We thought we understood. We did these five things and it broke everything. We don't know why. That's a great way to discover uh, and, uh, and uh, discover how to improve what you've already built, right? And what you want to do when you want to approach this as well, not as an attack, not as a negative thing. You want to say, this is not to, to show you where we failed. This is to discover how we can improve what we already have. All right, ultimately you wanna have your best customer experience. Okay, so the other question was uh, hands-on training. I don't know we have any. <laughs> so um, I don't think we do as a, as, as a uh, officially at AWS, we have any training around this, but I, I do know there are talks on the internet about this. That's a great question. In fact, I might even think about how to one day build a uh, workshop on this. I would like to do that. So maybe I can maybe in, early 2022 or something, I'll have a workshop built that can give you some hands-on training. But right now I'm not aware of anything specifically. Um, next question is how well can chaos engineering defend systems from different cyber attacks? Well, it's the same idea, right? Um, a cyber attack is a disruption of some sort. You're, maybe you're getting a DDoS, so your system goes offline, or maybe you're getting a, 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 uh, a, a phishing attack. Right, and you want to understand how your systems can improve or survive when someone maybe uh, falls for these things, or the DDoS, how you can mitigate a DDoS, and how you can survive and make sure your customers can get available. Right, so um, it, it can help with those. It will help everything. It will help you understand how your system behaves under those scenarios. Uh, chaos engineering doesn't solve your problems. It helps you identify where they are so you can re-engineer around them. Okay. Um, is chaos engineering similar to test engineering? Um, yeah, yes and no. It's related, but test engineering is more about looking for positive outcomes. Your, your, uh, you ran this test, you expect this outcome, right? We're doing the opposite. We have an outcome and we expect to see how it's happen what happens when it's disrupted. So it's kind of, I think they're kind of like, like uh, yin, and, yin and yang, right? They're, they're opposite sides of the same thing. Uh, where you're looking at, uh, you know, test, I'm building this, I want to make sure it behaves the way I expect it to. But now with chaos engineering, you have an expected behavior, you have system you know working the way you think it's supposed to work. How does it work when you introduce chaos into it? All right, that's, it's kind of learning what you've already built. Did it survive what you, did your, are your tests as complete as you think they are, right? So those are things you'll discover with chaos engineering. 
How can you do without any downtime? Ha, ah, that's, that's the great question. Um, so if you're resilient from the start, you won't have downtime, but you know, it's going to be disruptive. That's why we're saying manage your blast radius. Make sure you, 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 uh, you know the scope, you understand the dependencies and start small, get experience about doing this. And eventually you're going to have to, you know, you'll, you'll have to, uh, uh, get the approvals. I know one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to do without approvals and buying your leadership. Make sure your leadership knows what's going on. Make sure that they approve and and and, and understand the principles behind this. That help will make them more resilient and uh, help uh, help them have better customer experiences. Once they have that buy-in, then you start small, build your experience, build understand how to navigate these things here. And as you do that, you give the learnings that you have back to all the teams, the operations teams, the, the, the engineering teams, the QA teams, all the teams involved, so they understand how in the future to engineer around that, how to build, incorporate, and, 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 and address these things when they're designing. Because if you fix these things before you actually build them, uh, you'll actually be more successful. It's easier to do, less expensive. Um, does disaster recovery drill consider a chaos engineering? Um, not necessarily, because disaster recovery, you're really simulating, and actually very few companies will do a live DR. They'll actually do a, a simulated DR. They do like, a, like, a, like a, a game day where they'll pretend that something happened, and uh, um, they will then run through the run books or the processes, procedures to recover, right? In AWS, if you have your stacks built automatically, like with CloudFormation, you could deploy your stack in a different region and do a live test in a different region without disrupting your production. But it's the intention here is to really, uh, for, for DR, is to ensure that your systems are performing the way you expect to in a DR scenario. So maybe DR can be considered a large center of chaos, but you're you're not really, it's not intended the same way. It's because DR is also more about business continuity and how your business operates. Do you have you know, staffing far more than just these systems themselves? But um, it's a great question. And uh, I will actually think more about if I, can, if I can incorporate that relationship between DR, that's recovery, business continuity processing processes into chaos engineering. Um, and, uh, where do we, where can we do, can we build better infrastructure or blockchain for blockchain project related? Um, I don't know much about blockchain, pro, uh, itself. I mean, I know a little bit about it, but I really can't speak to that, unfortunately. So I have to skip that question here. Um, okay. When last question I see here is when injecting chaos into a system, how do you engage? What's the right amount of chaos? Well, that's an excellent question, actually. I, I like that. I'm going to incorporate that into my uh, presentation for the future. Uh, but um, what you want to do is you want to first understand the system, how it's supposed to behave, and understand all the dependencies it has. So you always start small. So um, you, if you have a simple three-tier architecture, which is a web server, an application server, and a database server, you know if you turn off your database server, you're going to have disruption, right? It's a pretty, pretty big one, right? So maybe start small. Start at the front end where you maybe have a web farm. You have two or three servers. Turn one off or disrupt that web server maybe or have too many connections so the web server can't process them and you're getting, you're starting, do you serve 500 errors? Do you have other issues? Those kind of things. Start there. Um, and then that, so you pick your pieces, but you got to understand where your single points of failure. So when you when i mentioned before you want to understand architecture and infrastructure you want to know end to end so you want to know how many servers are involved if or auto scaling if you're using auto scaling what that process is what triggers auto scaling um is it certain conditions like cpu or or, or utilization that will cause a new server to be launched or turned off those are things as well you can you can actually met, you can pick on that but pick smalls initially as you build experience doing this you'll then be able to gauge the right amount of chaos introduced when you're testing a system, right? Don't just minimize your blast, main, understand your blast radius. Don't make it too big because if you go in there and take everything down from the very first day, you're going to have a bad experience with leadership. They want to, you got to earn trust. We call the earning trust, right? So build your, do your tests, think about the infrastructure, the applications, the design and the dependencies they have, and then pick a piece and work from there and say, okay, I, I we have a database server, yeah, this has a secondary database server. I want to see what happens when the secondary goes offline. Okay, that's straightforward, no problem. Now let's try it with the primary. Does a failover happen? Is it automatic? Learn from those things. Is it documented already? Those are the things you can do. So pick 
but pick a small workload, build the experience, build the no body of knowledge, right? And then once you do that, you can get the trust with leadership to expand the radius, blast radius more and more to give more resiliency. Also, look at well-architected uh, on AWS to understand the principles and best practices around those five pillars because they're very important also for delivering resilient architectures. We talk about technology a lot, and this, this, this whole discussion has been, been about technology, but there's so much more to um, resiliency than just technology. You may have a perfect stack. You may have a perfect uh, design application and stuff, but do you have people that can support things? Uh, do you have your customer experience? How do you know if you're getting the right, uh, if you're using the right instance sizes and types, are you paying the right amount of money for what you're using? Those are the things also part of this as well. So, so try to, um, to, to learn and incorporate well architected into what you want to do for chaos engineering. Oh, yeah, I think that's the last question. Thank you very much, Paul. Oh, there's another one, Pahabol. Uh, yes, CICD pipelines is definitely use case for case engineering. Let's say you have automated process and you are <coughs> pushing out incremental changes. What happens if the changes don't push out properly? What happens if they don't roll back properly? How does it impact your, your, your situation? So yes, CI, CD pipeline is definitely part of what you want to introduce chaos into. All parts of this system, whatever, whatever, whatever incorporates that system, right? All right. So thanks everyone for your question. I think, yeah, we're just on time. So there Great. you go. You Great. just learned about chaos engineering. Thank you so much, Paul. And I hope it was another productive evening for all of you. Again, our Community Ignite series is co-presented by Amazon Web Services and AWS Club Filipinas by Educacion.ph. So make sure to follow our Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn to stay updated about this upcoming event. So there's um, someone who asked if there is a hands-on workshop, so we'll look at that, okay? So again, please be reminded that your e-certificate will be given after you fill up the CSAT survey form. There you go. And lastly, everyone, I want to take this opportunity to invite you all in a group photo. So if you want to be part of the picture, please feel free to open cam. Yes. Open come everyone so we can see your pretty faces, handsome faces wherever you are in the Philippines. There you go. How many pages do we have? We have two pages. Okay, so first page. Smile everyone. One, two, three. There you go. Second page so that we won't miss anyone. Smile. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So there you go. Dito po nagtatapos ang ating Community Ignite Series Chaos Engineering. Once again, see you again next week for another episode. And have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And see you. By the way, stay tuned. If you have a friend who missed this event, we have another round of Chaos Engineering topic with Mozilla PH on November 30, the same time, 6 to 7 p.m. It is also, we will publish that one as well on our Facebook page. So thank you everyone and good evening. Thank you, it was a pleasure, I really enjoyed. Thank you, Paul. Are you working on projects or making decisions that require understanding cloud fundamentals and benefits? The AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner Certification validates foundational cloud knowledge, including how the cloud impacts your business, core AWS services and use cases, billing and pricing models, and security concepts. Demonstrate your cloud fluency by achieving an industry-recognized credential from AWS. Highlight your proficiency and be a part of your organization's cloud adoption from any role. AWS Certified. Build with confidence, competence, and credibility.